So what I wanted to do over the next three nights, I just came from Dubai where I did a similar thing over there, um, is go over a little of this book that you have in front of you. In the Arabic it's called Menezen Sa'in, or Stations of the Wayfarers. And this book, I think, um, is very important, and books like it. Because what it does, it gives you uh, a framework, an idea, the keys to developing uh, yourself, how to be a better human being. And I think sometimes we lose sight that as Muslims, really what it's all about is not so much about being a better Muslim, but being a better human being. And you can't be a good Muslim without being a good human being. There's no such thing as, I'm a very good Muslim, but as a human being, yeah, I'm a Muslim. It has to be, uh, that's the whole point. And Islam really is the, uh, the means by which we can achieve that. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the Rasul and the Risala. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the messenger and the message. So everything about him is a message to us, and remains a message to us. And I think in, in the very divisive times that we live in today, people lose sight of that. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the discourse that goes back and forth between opposing groups uh, loses sight of the very basic intrinsic human qualities that should guide our path. And we get caught up in sort of um, trivial matters, so to speak, uh, and, not, and, and, not, and then not practice exactly what we're here to do. And so, everyone has needs, human beings have physical needs, and they also have emotional and spiritual needs. And if those emotional and spiritual needs are not met by something that is pure, then they'll be met by something that is poisonous. Just like with food and drink. If you don't have access to healthy, wholesome food, you'll eat junk food. Right? And even though you feel like you're eating it and you're getting your need, you're not really getting your need because it's going to have a bad effect on you and your health. And today we see sort of the proliferation of kind of these uh, new age spiritual movements, so to speak. Um, Deepak Chopra and uh, Tony Robbins and all those type of Stephen Covey some are corporate like some are not corporate but the main idea is there's kind of an appeal to um, personal development and improvement so that you can become uh, a better person who has uh, how to make friends and influence people or to uh, become a more self-reliant better person I think the whole meditation, mindfulness uh, discourse also is, is plugging into that. So it's, it's, it's addressing a basic human need that is not being met in many ways. And traditionally, uh, this was met via religion. And people are not finding a lot of hope in finding that in religion, because religion, as I said, the discourse, whether it's in Islam or in other faith traditions, become very divisive. It's become very identity driven. What group are you from, and, and what uh, you know, what madhab, and what following, and all that type of thing. So, I think it's clouded and obscured what we really have. Uh, and I'm a firm believer. I'm completely committed to the idea that within our Islamic tradition, especially in terms of spiritual development, we have all that we need, and we have something that's way more sophisticated and true than anything else out there. More than the meditation, the mindfulness, the Deepak Chopra, the gurus, all of that. I'm not saying they don't have some element of benefit in them, they may. But there is no uh, sort of complete and total uh, system that is not only based upon the Quran and Sunnah, but there's also an element of uh, Tajruba. These are things that have been kind of tried and tested as well before. So they, they really looked into the human psyche uh, and the human soul and they arrived at certain certainties, if you will, about, about that. And so this particular genre, um, you know, we call it the Sawuf, Sufism, 
right? And it's kind of a, a buzzword now, how it always has been, and, and pictures, you know, you'll hear people from some of the Manabin in Qahira al-Asaf saying, Quburiyu, and then those who worship graves, and those who, you know, dance in the masjid, and sing, and, uh, you know, smoke bango at the same time, all that type of thing. But that's not what we mean by the soul. The soul actually is uh, There's many tarifat, there's many definitions to it, but one of the, I think the most succinct and best ones is you learn to have the character of the Prophet Muhammad. So the Sunnah reflects that. The Sunnah, it'll tell you about what the Prophet said, how he sat, how he ate, uh, how he dealt with people, um, how he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his ibadat. So these are actions. But in Nabi Sallallahu also had ahwal. And this, I think, is the missing part of our Islam today. That there is a, uh, a big concern, rightly so, but perhaps an overemphasis on kind of the do's and don'ts of Islam. Halal and haram. And we lose sight of, you know, that those things are really a means to something bigger and better, and it's to embody the ahwal, the states, the maqamat of the salihin, of the awliya, of ultimately the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi So, as I said, this book comes from a particular genre, which looks at these states, and how one can progress from one to the next, and how one can, as I said, have a framework by which to evaluate, you know, where you're at with that. You know, you want to be someone who is ta'ib, or zahid, or uh, muhib, and ayib, uh, or alim, or munib. All these things that they're going to talk about, um, there are certain kind of uh, milestones or mark posts along the road that you can identify to figure out if, you know, where am I at with this. And the way that Sahib uh, al-Manazir, Imam al-Harawi al-Ansari, he was from Herat, which is from the traditional intellectual center of Khorasan, which included back then parts of modern-day uh, Iran and Afghanistan and some of the, the northern Central Asian states. Nowadays, Herat is in Afghanistan. Um, and he wrote this book, and he divided it into ten chapters of ten states, so a hundred altogether. The first one is called Babu Yatala the chapter of awakening. And the last one is called the Tawheed, the chapter of Tawheed. And then everything in between is kind of getting you from waking up till you get to a point where Tawheed is not just pronouncing that in the love, but it's actually living it, uh, embodying it in, in every moment and every aspect of your life, which is the ultimate goal of the deen, is to do that. And then you have all those things in between. And in each state, he talks about certain levels, usually three, and he talks about al-Muqtadi'een, al-Muqtawasitin, al Or he'll say al-Amma al-Khasa, or khasa al khasa And these are terms that they use to kind of delineate where people are at in their particular spiritual development. And it often uh, corresponds to the hadith of Sima Jibreel alayhi salam about Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. So Islam corresponds to the outward acts. And Iman corresponds to um, the inward acts. And then Ihsan is then doing both of those uh, in, in the manner that is uh, emblematic of the way of the Prophet Muhammad with Ihsan. Like, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. So, uh, what I wanted to do, the cheat that you have in front of you has the first ten. So in the next three nights, including tonight, I wanted to cover those ten. Um, I don't think we're going to read word for word because that's, I think, a little laborious and take too long. What I'll try to do is kind of um, get through the main points. Uh, sometimes I read word for word, sometimes I won't. And the text you have in front of you, under that, has both the Arabic and the English next to each other. Um, I don't always like the English translation, sometimes I think it's imprecise, but uh, for the most part we'll, we'll follow that and if I think we have a better word, I, uh, I might mention that.
So, in the introduction, on page 28, after he does the traditional basmala and hamdala and salawat and salawat and the sallallahu he then says that he wrote this book out of a request from some of his students. And what he maintains is that he wrote this book to sort of formalize it, to make it a discipline. So the study of the Tasawwuf in this matter is actually a sort of academic discipline, much in the same way that we study Hadith or Tafsir or Fiqh or Suri Fiqh. So, you know, when people say Madhab Sufiya or Harakat Sufiya, these terms are uh, uh, not applicable. At, 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 wor- at best, they're imprecise. At worst, they uh, they mischaracterize and misrepresent. Because ha- Sufi is not a haraka. It's not a movement in that sense. It's not an ideological movement like other harakat. Um, and it's not a madhab. It's not a, 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 a distinct theological or fiqh school of thought. We have the four madhab in fiqh. We have the two schools in theology. And the sawuf is something that is not classified in those things. It's it's part of the deen, as I said, and it looks at the sort of practical aspect of, of application and where your heart should be. And there's different styles in how they went about that. Sheikh Zalruq, he says that Imam Ghazali gives you sort of tasawuf al-mujahada, the tasawuf of uh, discipline, self-discipline. So if you read a Hayat al Din or other books by Imam al-Nazari, the Tasawwuf kind of tells you certain practices to do and it gives you a little bit of insight into some of the secrets behind some of the Ibadat. He has, you know, Kitab al-Salah al-Salah, al-Salah al-Zakah, al-Salah al-Hajj, al-Salah al-Siyam, and so forth. And uh, there's another type of uh, genre which would be this book that he calls uh, that literally means the you know the mujahada that's put into or tasawwuf al fana, which means to kind of remove the impurities from your soul, remove the obstacles that uh, that prevent you from actually having a better ibadah, better relationship with Allah subhanahu wa taala, better relationships with people, right? Because we have amrad, nafsiya, right? We have uh, greed, we have envy, we have uh, Jealousy, we have Hubbul Riyasa, like to be in charge, we have Hubbul Jah, or Sum'ah, want to have a good reputation, prestige, status, and many of these things, if they lead you around, if they take control of you, then they'll lead you to do acts purely for the sake of capturing people's attention. And that's a, a lesser form of shirk, right? Because when you do things not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're doing it for people, then it's as if you don't really care that Allah is looking at it, but that the people are taking attention for you. And so, fanat means fanat and nafs. In other words, fanat of the ego. So the ego, or nafs, gets in the way of a lot of things. And they used to say, that the nafs is more despicable than 70 devils. Because it's very devious, it's very tricky. It will convince you that what you're doing is perfectly right and maybe perfectly Islamic. And not to listen to the naysayers, not to listen to what people who may contravene what you have to say. So learning to kind of listen to the plotting and the tricks of the nafs is something that is very, very important for every Muslim to do. And we call this, uh, you know, an insaf. Right, and soft means that you're very fair-minded when it comes to your own actions, especially as they relate and compare to other people. So if you get an argument with somebody or a dispute, the nafs is going to tell you you're right, they're wrong. Automatically. Right, without really even considering what their argument is or what your argument is or did I do anything to precipitate their uh, discontent. So the rest will, will disregard all of that, I will say that. But the Sahamawa Khalid. 
But if you have this insaf and learn to recognize within yourself, then you say, well, there's a, there is always the possibility, at least I'll entertain it, that I'm wrong and they're right. And when you entertain that possibility, you not only have insaf, you have tawadah, uh, uh, you have humility. Right? And these are prophetic character traits. So when we say, the khaluq, the akhlaq, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi it means to be like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in those things, especially his character. So it's not just prophetic to, to stand in the first row the salah in Masjid, but it's also prophetic that if when you leave the Masjid and you see someone carrying off with your shoes, that the first thought to your mind should be maybe that they're stealing it. But rather, maybe the first thought is, oh, maybe they took it by accident. So rather than being confrontational with them and say, hey, you stole my shoes, you can say, oh, I think maybe you took them by accident, rather than you stole them. That would be more prophetic than running after them and you know, hitting them and grabbing them and saying, how long give me my shoes back? So, um, you know, these are the type of things that I think have always brought people more into Islam. And I've attracted them more to the deen because they see the transformational power of the prophetic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, Imam Hanawi said he wrote this in response to some of the students asking to write something more formal. And he wrote it to, as he says here, to distinguish between the different stations. He calls them manazil, sometimes they're called maqams, maqamat. Um, and they differentiate these from ahwal. So the hal is something that you may feel on a temporary basis in, uh, in reaction to a particular event or a particular uh, act of worship. So most people when they come back from uh, Umrah or Hajj, there's a particular hal that they're in. Right? They're, kind of, they're different. And usually that state doesn't last a long time. It goes away. And people recognize this had thing and they want more of it. That's why I think the Umrah has kind of become sort of this sort of uh, uh, that people want to keep going back and back because they realize like, you know, I changed and I was good and I want that again. And they're trying to, you know, capture that had. But the thing is, those ahwal are not supposed to last. They're, they're kind of spiritual gifts and the, the, the feeling that you have um, is not the point. It's supposed to help you along. So the maqam is where you sit for a longer period of time or the, you know, for the manzala is where you sit for a longer period of time rather than just you know, being enamored with a particular good feeling or euphoria that you felt after you made Umrah, after you made Hajj, uh, after you um, you know, uh, pray to eat, whatever it might be. So any of those devotional acts, you know, that's not what it's supposed to be. But the actual work of the maqam or the or the manazi, it's much more um, hard, much harder to get through because it's about removing impurities. Whereas these ahwal, I think it's more about jumping into a temporary state that makes you forget you have these Mashakit, right? But sooner or later you come back to them and you realize that they're still there. So the Maqam is supposed to kind of um, purify you from this. So if you look to the, page, the bottom of page uh, 32 or 33 in Arabic, He says, "Wa'alam min al-amata min al-ulama hadi al-tariqa, wa al-mushirin ila hadi al-tariqa, tafaku ala al-nihayat la tasihu illa bi tasihu al-bilayat, kama an al-abniyata la taqum illa ala al-asas. Wa tasihu al-bilayat huwa iqamat al-amri ala al-mushahadat al-ikhlas, wa mutabat al-sunna, wa ta'zim al-mahi ala al-mushahadat al-khawfi wa ri'ayat al-hurati wa al-shafaqa ala al-alam, بذل النصيحة وكف المؤنة ومجانبة كل صاحب يفسد الوقت وكل سبب يفسد القلب. So that's very important. So it's correcting the beginnings means setting up matters by contemplating 
uh, devotion, following the sunnah and extolling the prohibitions by thinking about fear, attention to harm or sanctity, and being compassionate towards human beings by offering advice and abstaining from hoarding, taking things that they have, and by staying away from any companion who violates at the moment and from any source of seduction or fitna for the heart. So the people then are of three types, as he said, in this regard. The first is a person, and when he says man here, he means man or woman, he doesn't mean man, um, who acts divided between fear and hope, fixing his eyes on love, coupled with self restraint. Yeah, and he's trying. This one is called murid, min arada, to want to desire, to seek. وَرَجُلْ مُخْتَطِفٌ مِنْ وَادِي تَفَرُّطِ إِلَى وَادِي الْجَمْعِ وَهُمْ وَذَادِي يُقَادَهُ الْمُرَادِ Another one is snatched from the valley of dispersion to the valley of reunion. That's very... What does that mean? <clears throat> so it's not an actual wadi, it's not an actual valley, but التفرق or التفرق means kind of a lack of realization and mushahada and witnessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every moment, in every act. In a way the jama', which is the opposite, which is to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every act and every moment. So this one is muhtaqaf, he's snatched. Who snatches him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why he's called murad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wanted him. So, this type of person is the one who may not go through all of this hundred steps, but he kind of, or she kind of already is there at the end, right? But usually we refer to such a person that if it's done in such a way, they still have to kind of go back to the beginning of food again. But their path is going to be from the end towards the beginning. Because when someone is in that state, then it's usually good for them, but they're not really good for anybody else. You know, in our parlance, we call them again, majazib, majzub. Um, because they're not there with you. They're completely somewhere else. So when they find themselves in the state of complete fanat, they're, they're not really functioning in a sense where you can benefit from them and emulate them. So they have to kind of go through the towards the front again, and then wind up in the same place as in Murid. So most people, if they're sincere, they're going to be in the first category, the Murid category. And there's going to be a few that, you know, by Allah subhanahu wa by His will, by His rahmah, will find themselves in the second. And He said there's three, so what's the third one? And anyone other than those two is a pretender, vain, and deluded. So anyone who claims anything else, even that they're not murid and they're not murad, or that they are kind of in a place where sakat al-taklif or sakat al-kulfa, I don't have to do these things anymore, I've arrived and I don't have to. This is a dihat. It's making a claim and it's a lie. It's not true. No one is going to be exempt from following the sharia, following the Quran and sunnah, no matter what. There's no situation that's not going to happen. So anyone who claims otherwise, look down at them, they're lying. Um, they're making a false claim. And then he says, So all of these maqamat, the hundred, or the ten we're doing now, there's going to be three levels, or three degrees. The first, rutbatul ula, ahdul qasid fi sayyir so the first, Ahlul Qasid Fisayr, is when you begin, when you make a decision and say, I am not just going to live sort of the uh, life that's on automatic pilot, uh, just reactionary, but I want to be very deliberate, purposeful, and thinking about the things that I do, so I can be someone who I have the potential to be. 
So he calls this Aqs al Qasid al Sayyid. Al Qasid, yani, the one who has an intention, the one who is seeking, the one who is now made a decision to do something different. After that, when he makes this decision, she makes this decision, they will find there's going to be a certain level of alienation, worldwide, strangeness to it. Why? Because there's not too many people doing that. The vast majority of people are not doing that. The Quran tells us that. Few of the people are shukur. Yeah. They're still ibad. Right? They're still Muslim and they still have their hurma and ihtiram and all those things. But are they yeah, in this particular path with Sayyid? Very few. Because it's not an easy path, it's a difficult one. So they are going to feel a certain type of alienation in Urba. That's normal. And in the third level, Hasulu al Mushahada al Jazid al Ain al Tawheed. Entering, uh, he says, ecstatic contemplation, I would say Mushahada is witnessing. In other words, it's a necessary witnessing. You just, it just happens to you, you just feel it. Right? All of the shukuk, all of the doubts, all of the hesitations, all of the uh, uncertainties go away. And then all you see is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you're no longer a type of person who has acted all that, who has objections to everything that happens everywhere. But rather, you've been given a key that unlocks the door of uh, certainty. Right? Certainty in Allah's will and His power, in the oneness of His deeds and His acts and His attributes and essentially the oneness of His essence. And to get to that, uh, that requires Allah SWT to want it for you. And it's not just doing particular acts and hope, no, but it's a gift. And this is what the whole point is, to get to that particular point. And the third person that he's talking about, that's Hadam uh, al-Awliya, yeah. That's a wedding. Who can get to that point? So, um, and then he mentioned hadith about hadith and mufarridun, about the ones who are kind of alone and solitary, and they're the ones who tremble at the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the one he's mentioning is the first uh, rutbah. And he also mentioned the second one, where he mentioned the hadith Tard al Haq or another hadith that I don't think he mentions here, which is uh, Islam began strange, it's going to end strange, and so Tuba al Gurabat. They said Tuba is either a name of one of the levels of paradise or it's the Jannah in general. Uh, so the path of strangeness, of alienation, of uh, it should be something that at the same time may be initially uncomfortable. But ultimately, you should find comfort in it, because that's the path of the prophets and the Aliyah of Salih before us. And then he mentions the hadith of Imam Islam al Ihsan in regards to the third level about the Mushahida. Ta'abidullah ka'annaka tarah. Binnam ta'abu tarah, binnam ayyamah. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. <coughs> but it's interesting that. This hadith means that you have to have some khayal, you have to have some imagination. Why? Because it says, Ta'bullah ka'anna katawam. As if you see him. Which means it's, uh, it's not going to happen literally, right? But when we say mushahada, it's a type of khayali mushahada, right? A type of imaginary. In other words, you have not necessarily an image in your head of seeing Allah, but the concept of seeing Allah in everything. And that's the goal of Ihsan. And that's better than just knowing that Allah sees you. That's an intellectual understanding. Know that He sees you. But to see Him, 
something different and, and much higher altogether. So the next page, 4041, he talks about all of the um, the particular of web. So each each of the ten has a chapter head. So they begin with al bidayat and akhlaq and al-ahwal and al-abwal and al-usul, wayat, nihayat, mu'amalat, al-awdiyya, wal haqaiq. So from beginnings all the way to endings, as you can see. And what we're only going to do now is the beginnings. And hopefully at a later date we'll do the rest of them. And then the part we're going to read, the beginnings, has ten in them. So they're yaqadah, wa tawbah, wa muhasabah, wa tiyabah, wa tafakkur, wa tadakkur, wa i'tisam, wa al-firar, wa riyadah, wa sabah. So awakening, repentance, reckoning, turning to God, reflection, remembrance, taking shelter, flight, discipline, and audition. Uh, the sheets that you have that were passed out reflect those ten, and we'll go over it too. Each one of them has some kind of, I put uh, together some pointers or some things to consider, maybe some things to do in relation to each uh, particular maqam or menzah. So chapter 1, the next page, beginning with Ba'at al -yakala. And the nice thing about Ibn Haram is that he starts each section with an A of Qur'an that's reflective of what he's trying to go with. Allah Azza wa Jal, Kul innama a'idukum bi wahida, an taqoomu lillah. I exhort you to one thing only, to rise up to Allah. So he says in Qawla, Lillah, haya jafalatu min sanat al-ghafla, wa nuhud min watat al-fatra. So, waking, awakening from the slumber of heedlessness, ghafla, right? And ghafla is usually the default state. And it's so default that people, even when they go to pray, they're still with the ghafli, because they're thinking about other things. Before, during, and after. Uh, so sometimes people, uh, the shiukh are asked, how does one, you know, have hudur in the prayer? How can I get to the point where, you know, fakr for salam, rakis, okay? They said, you will not have hudur in the prayer until you have hudur outside of the prayer. Because the idea of the hudur is to be all the time, not just the salah and then I go do something else, whatever I want to do that's contravene or mukhalif, but rather it's all kind of one path. So the prayer is just supposed to be an elevation, right, and then you kind of get on it, but you're still kind of moving forward and not moving backwards after it. Uh, and so, you know, the Prophet said, he kind of, he mentions this, he alluded to this. Whoever's prayer doesn't prevent them from doing corrupt, saying corrupt things, and saying, uh, doing corrupt acts, then they move further away. Right? The Quran talks about iqamat al salah. But when it says just al salah mugarrada and al iqama, then it's not a good thing. Blame to them. You know, woe to them. Because they're remiss about their prayer. It's just kind of a thing they do. But it's not the thing that's supposed to transform them. Just like people go to Umrah Hajj and they get transformed, that's the objective of the five prayers too. That after each prayer that you come out of it different than you went into it. Right? And to, to really do that, then you have to have this sort of tahakkum in your time. Because the salawat are zakawat al awqat. It's the zakat of time. Just like when we pay zakat, because sometimes or usually much of our income or some of it will be dubious. Is it 100% halal? Maybe a little is not. So this is a purification of wealth. Zakat. That's what zakat means to purify. Uh, but if it's uh, the time, all the time that we waste, then the salawat, that's why they're five and they're spaced throughout the day. Not any time you want to do it, right? 
Ibn al-Sawazakan al-Mu'minina kitaban mawquta So throughout the day, because throughout the day you're wasting your time. So you need to have throughout the day the kind of purifying between that. And Muslims, there was a time when the rhythm of the day would be determined by Salat al-Khams. Not by uh, what time is it, but rather Abd al-Dhuhr, Ba'd al-Dhuhr, Abd al-Asr, Ba'd al-Asr, Ba'd al-Maghrib, Ba'd al-Isha. That's how people used to shut up when they would meet each other. I'll see you after this prayer or before this prayer. Um, and that kind of made the rhythm of the day. But nowadays, if we fit in the prayer when it's convenient. And then everything else is kind of the important thing. So, um, so it's awakening. It's waking up. And it says this yatala is three things. In other words, when we wake up, when we say we want to change our life, what is it that happens exactly? And that's what I mean when I have this insight into the kind of the spiritual psyche. So it says, أول لاحظ القلب إلى النعمة على الياس من عدها والوقوف على حدها وتفرع إلى معرفة الجنة بها والعلم بتقصير في حقها so it's interesting that the first thing he mentions is knowing al-ni'ma, the blessing. Usually when people think about, I have to wake up from my ghafla, I have to wake up from that state I'm in, it's very kind of uh, strong and negative uh, discourse talking about, you, commit, you make so many sins, you do so many bad things wrong, you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn in the fire, so wake up. Before it's too late. And that's usually how most of the khutaba and the imma, that's how they talk. When they want to people to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Imam al Harawi, he didn't start with that. He said, Ma'rifat al Ni'am. Lahad al Ni'am. Think about all the good you have in your life. Right? So he wants to take us on a path not of, uh, I'm afraid to burn, but rather. I want to look at all the good, I want to be thankful. I want to show gratitude. Right? And to me, this is what makes you know, these people, the true people of the soul, distinctive from other people. In that they know that the human heart, um, what appeals to it, and what's going to move it. Yes, some people will be motivated by fear and driven by it, and he doesn't neglect that. It's the second thing that he mentions. But the first thing that he mentions is knowing the ni'mah. And knowing that you can never count how many now, how many blessings that you have. Right? So it's showing you that you're essentially in a good state. You're essentially in a pure state. But um, you know, show the show the right gratitude for it, show the right shukr for it by doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Why the can't the and Nabi Swaksa? That's how it goes with people. He would say about Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, uh Nama Rajul Abdullah, Lola. And you know how good, how clear the Sahabi is Abdullah, but if he were to pray at night, he would have a beer out, then he'd be Haga and Fokul Wasr. That's how we motivate people, that's how we encourage them. Mish enta flan wa ta rahi dalat mish arafi enta kazab enta. So, uh, this is the thing that will sustain you on that path. Because I really believe that if you're purely motivated by fear, it's not sustainable. You're not, you're not designed this way. We're not made like that. It's kind of uh, a thing that you, maybe a wake-up call, alarm bell, but think about if you had the alarm and it's on all the time. Beep, 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 all the time. Music, right? We don't listen to that. But when we're constant pegging of hell, fire, it's like an alarm bell all the time. Alarm bell, not big, 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 He's giving you life, he's giving you existence, he maintains your existence. The fact that you're here and there's not a billion other people in your place that Allah could have chosen means you're important, you're significant. 
I mean that Allah wants you to be here. And if He wants you to be here, then He wants good for you. He doesn't want bad for you. So the first thing that about Tanbih, think about yeah, the blessings. Then He mentions the second thing. مُطَالَعَةِ الْجِنَاءِ وَالْوُقُوفَ عَلَى الْحَصْرِ فِيهَا وَالتَّشْمِيرُ بِتَدَارُبِهَا وَالتَّخَلُّصُ مِنْ رَبْقِهَا وَطَلَبُ النَّجَاتِ بِتَنْحِيسِهَا Even the way that he talks about it, right? First he calls it the uh, which means that it's like, it's a transgression, it's a slip, but it's not something that defines the person. So, al-wukuf ala hadr right? To 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 really realize and stop and know that uh, it's very damaging to you. He doesn't say because you're gonna go to hell because of it, but he says it's gonna have some damaging effects on you, on your heart, right? If you're on this particular path, then know that when you commit a sin or a mistake like that. It kind of it it it, uh, it gives you a detour, and it may take a while to come back. So avoid that completely, right? Part of awakening is saying, I realize the detrimental effects that I can have on me in my heart, and you know, tadaro means to try to stop before you do it, or make amends if you happen to fall into it. And then the third thing. الانتباه لمعرفة الزيادة والنقصان في الأيام والتنصب عن تضييعها ونظر إلى الطن بها ويتدارك فائتها ويعمل باقيها باقيها. The third is being alert and discerning the increase and decrease in should be Allah's days, not dispensations. I don't know why I said that. Um, Stephen Spalding. So, النقصان وزيادة في الأيام means that you don't have forever to live. Right? You understand that I can't just wait until I am at retirement age and then I'll think about fixing things. Or I'll wait until I, the kids are growing up a little bit. Or I'll wait until you know we're able to buy that... Uh, house in the Sahel Shemel that we wanted, or I'll wait until... You're always going to have something to wait for. I'll wait till I finish college. I'll wait till I get this job. I'll wait till I do this. You're always going to be busy with something. Right? Ibn al-Qadr al Sakandari in the he mentions this. Someone who keeps waiting and waiting waiting, you're going to be waiting forever. Because you're always going to be busy with something. So, the idea then is to prioritize right now. Right? There's no waiting. Because it could be over for you tomorrow, or even before tomorrow. So what are you waiting for? So those three things taken together, right, will lead or consist of a uh, to wake up. So uh, thinking about the now, the blessings, considering the damaging effects of sins, and uh, knowing that your days are not going to be forever, and that uh, it's not time to waste, and it's time to start right now. Then he goes into, well, how do I get to those three? So it begins with the ni'mah. Right? How can I get to this point of this ni'mah that I really have a proper kind of understanding of it, and I'm doing it right? It starts with three things. بنور العقل وشيء مبارك المنا والاعتبار بأهل البلاء. The first نور العقل, the light of the mind, means that uh, you have فكر that is uh, is صافي. You have kind of a clear way of looking at things. Because if you see that the you know if you don't see the blessing to begin with. Right? If you don't even recognize it, but all you see is negativity in your life, and you don't see anything else, then that's kind of in the Muslim basira, it's kind of a blackening or a darkening of this light of the ox. So it's to open yourself up to the idea that 
maybe there's some things I don't see and let me, let me see them for real. And without that, you won't see the blessing. You'll just see the negative things. She uses some uh, metaphoric language, but you know that in minna min Allah. That in other words, Allah actually is not obligated to give you the things that you want. You can't say, I don't salli wa zakki wa sum, khalas fadda wa bilba ani dini sha'a wa arabiya wa sha'a ish. It's not. He's not obligated to do anything. La yusal amma yaf'al wa hum yusalu. No one asks him about what Allah does, but we are asked about what we do. And so, this sort of uh, tigara relationship that some of us have with Allah, we kind of make deals all the time. Right? I don't have a kazo kazo by then. The thing is, you don't understand is if you do one, two, three, how that fat aslan? Right? If Allah SWT gives you tawfiq and you do those things that you think you're doing for something else, that actually is the thing you should be asking help with, the thing, the thing that you should be seeking. And those other things are immaterial, they're not that important if they're things of the dunya. Yeah. But the important thing is. You know, that those things are, are they're alamat, they're not mujibat. They're signs that Allah will die. Not, they're not things to make Allah pleased with you. Don't say, the one salat was a kid, was slumped, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hailed the kid. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you did those things. Allah that kid, don't feel to do that to begin with. So why are you expecting even more after that? Yeah, indeed, had the zat al already. And then the third thing in اعتبار بأهل البلاء is to consider what happens to people who are in a state of trial and tribulation. Right? And أهل البلاء يعني كلمة عامة It means ممكن ما حكم تلا في ديني ممكن ما حكم تلا في في مالي في أسرتي في حاجات كثيرة So all of those types of different اتلاءات the reason that they're there to begin with one of the reasons they're to begin with the divine wisdom is so that we can have this اعتبار how would we have a, a measure of the blessing of sight unless we didn't know that people may, some people don't have sight, they can't see, or some people can't hear, and some people can't walk, right? So those things, you learn to appreciate them, that you have them, because it was quite possible that you may not have had them ever. And so those people then, it's not a punishment to them, they're actually you know, they're like the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. They're ayat ayat min ayat illah. They're signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah chose them for that purpose. Just like He chose the sun and the moon and the stars and the ocean and the mountains as ayat, right, to know Allah, they too become a means by which others can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their maqam is ali, it's high. It's not something that's, it's not a punishment to them. And then He says, how about mutalat al How about kind of stopping at the sin and the mistake? What do we need to do that? Bitaadim al haq wa ma'rifat al nafs wa tasdiq al wa'id. So taadim al haq, Allah subhanahu wa taala means that it's not about the sin; it's about who you're sinning against. Right? You don't say like tasim. I need to have it. He is, but you still willfully did that, right? You still took that step and did it anyway and knew that it was wrong. So at that particular point when you did it, how could you, how was that ta'zim, right? That's maybe, I would say, ihmal al haq. Right? It's like ignoring or tajahu and just being negligent. So that means ta'adim al haq means we could be sadir or kabir. Wa ma'rifat al nafs. Right? Knowing the ego, as I mentioned earlier on, that it's very tricky and devious. Right? And it's going to try to put you in situations just so that it could be satisfied. So you have to be aware of these things, right, in order to 
have an understanding of the jinaya or the sin it could lead you to if you let it go the way it wants to go. And then tasdiq al wa'id, right? The Quran, we, when we talk about an ayat that deals with al jannah, an ayat that deals with al nar, the first one is called al wa'ad. Wa'ad means promise. In Allah, la yukhufil mi'ad. He always carries out what he promises. Amma al wa'id, it means threat. And the ulama of, uh, of Atira, they said, the threat doesn't necessarily have to be carried out. So when there's a threat with hellfire, with punishment, with these things, it doesn't mean that Allah is promising it's going to happen to people, but it is the possibility. And it's there more as a warning, as an admonition. Unlike al wa'ad right? But nevertheless, he says, tasdiq al wa'id You have to, you should believe it. Right, that it could be you. And that's the adab of the believer, that's the etiquette. Yes, whoever has It's true. But the Prophet even was hesitant to tell Ibn Abbas to he told people, he told him, Don't tell everybody about this. Right? Because then I take Say, Oh, that's it. Uh, we're good. We do anything we want. That's not the point. The point of that is to count that this is a great blessing, that even from a little bit of la ilaha illallah, I can again. But tasdil al wa'id, that it can apply to me. And the Bakr Siddiq, he said, if I had one foot in paradise and one foot out, I wouldn't be sure that I'm going in. Right? That's tasdil al wa'id. And then the last one, ma'arifat al-ziyadah wa al-muqsan fi al-ayyam, tasdiqim bi thalathi al-ashya, bi sama'a al-ilm, wa ijabat al-wa'id al-hurmah, wa sohbat al-salihin, so listening to knowledge, right, making an effort to uh, to make uh, some part of your daily, weekly, monthly routine that you learn new things, that you listen to admonition and mawaila that will remind you that the days are numbered. To um, to answer the requirements of hurma, you know that. Everything in life is somewhat sacred in a sense. So that which Allah sacralizes, which, which He makes sacred, is sacred. And uh, that includes your days and nights. They're a gift. So in a sense they're sacred. So why do you corrupt them? Why do you sully them and put filth in them? When it's something that is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah swears by it. Or duha, or as, or fed. All of these are times, right? This is by time. So it's a sacred thing. So to, to sully it, to corrupt it with profane things, things that are not sacred, is contravening the idea that you know these days are numbered. Well Salihin. Keep good company too. Right? Someone who reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then keep company with those people because they're gonna also remind you that we're all in this together and the days are only so much. And the key to all of this, breaking your habit. Which is why this is hard, as I said in the beginning. We don't like to break our habits. We like what's familiar, what's ma'loof, what's mu'atad. Right? We don't like to try, people say they like to try new things, but they don't really try to new things. They like what's familiar, you know, the routine. And um, one of the things about this path is you have to really learn how to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, often. A lot. Uh, maybe even every day. Because if you're just comfortable in your skin, comfortable with everything that's going on, they actually call that, it's a type of spiritual malady, a rida on the nafs. Right? If you're pleased with the way you are and, and what's going on with you, then uh, you've kind of put a roadblock to changing, to becoming better. So right, removing bad habits is essential to all of this awakening in the beginning. So if you look to your uh, sheet, is there an extra copy somewhere? These are just simple exercises and things that you might be able to do. So 
So I said, and Yafadah, count ten of your blessings that you have right now. If you can't think of ten, I appreciate all. Because you should be able to think of like a million. But ten, you know, ten is, is nothing. But if you make a habit of thinking about those things, right? And I think even all those uh, self-help guru guys, even Kobe, they say something like that. Like, you know, to, to be happy, always think about the good things you have in your life and don't worry about the bad things and so forth. We call this now, because in the Quran, the Quran is the Right, when you think about the Quran, the blessing, then this is how you can learn to recognize the Quran, learning in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Prophet said about him in the Shema'in, can you judge the Quran, and can you judge the Quran, and can you judge the Quran? He used to see the Quran as a big deal, when, even if it seems small. And the reason for that is because it's not about the Nama itself, it's about the Nunim, the one who gave it to you. And we even do that in real life, right? If you get a present like a, uh, uh, I don't know, a card that just has words in it from someone you don't care too much about, or that you don't have a very uh, a relationship with so much, like uh, a friend at work, a colleague, they send a birthday card around and they all signed it and they give it to you. It's like, okay, it's a nice thing, you know, quays, tamam. But if you get a note or a card for someone that you love, right, someone that you may be pursuing, it's a whole different thing when you get that card. Because that's something that you have a lot of, uh, not ta'atim, but you have a, a, a more of a, a, a greater appreciation that comes from that particular source. So think about it, it was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even the little things should be a big deal. Right? So think ten of your blessings. Think about how you should show proper gratitude for them. Right? So if I have the blessing of life, then I should use my life in a good way. If I have the blessing of sight, then I should not look at things that are damaging to my sight, right? And then to my heart, so forth. Think about ten mistakes that you currently commit. Also, if you can't think of ten, appreciate Allah to come up. Right? And then, think about three things you do habitually that may contribute to the ten mistakes. Because one of the things about this path and about Islam in general is that it doesn't tell you to um, just stop cold turkey and khalas. Just have the will and it will stop. It actually tells us, help yourself by avoiding the circumstances and situations that may lead to those things where you make mistakes. So let's say you have a path that you walk every day to go to work or to school, and you pass by Kushk and Bibia Segev, and you have a problem with cigarettes. So usually by habit, you walk by, oh, okay, I wasn't going to smoke today, but Madame, uh, I'm passing by, you buy a thing. What do you think the smart thing would be? Why should I tempt myself every day as I walk past that? Why don't I just take a different route if I can? Take another way, another street, drive another place. In order so that I take myself out of the situation where I am tempted. So it's not about saying, uh, yeah, it's not fahlawa kida or bigara and, you know, give me the thing, tempt me with it, whenever I have a, have a, a no, that's not the way it is. None of the salihin were like that. And they would say that someone who, did, who had that attitude, if they said to Allah, try me as you wish, and add them all law, they said, هذا كذب هذا ادعاب. Right? You don't want to be tried like that. You want to completely avoid it. So avoid the places where, of temptation. Avoid the places where that, the circumstance is going to lead you to that. Rather than saying, you know, let me show Allah what I'm made of. That's not how they did it. Yeah. So that's the first chapter of uh, Yaqala. The next one is Tawbah, or Repentance. Many of the other books start off with Tawbah. Like the Azali starts with Tawbah, he doesn't specifically mention called Yaqala. But, and they say Tawbah is our Maqam is Sadiqeen, which is true. So the Sadiq or a Sayyid is the one who's made a decision to do something different, to live a different type of life. But you don't get to that unless you have 
yaqaza to begin with, you wake up. So lazim al yaqaza. Right? And then, mumkin tiba, tibda tariyat al surub. So, he begins with the ayah, wa man lam yatub fa ulaika humu zalimun. Fa asqata ismu zulmi ala al-taib, wa al-tawwatu la tasihu ila ba'da ma'arifat al-zamb. So, he mentions here that whoever does tawbah, who repents, who does itab, then at least they remove the minimum that happens, you're no longer zalim. Asqata ismu tul. Because he said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُوبْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مُظَالِمُونَ يَعْنِ الَّذِي يَتُوبْ لَيْسَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ The one who makes tawbah is not from the zalim. So, there is no other, it is the most basic uh, spiritual aspect to, to the human condition, this thing we call Tawbah. Right? When we're introduced to Sayyidina Adam in the Quran, the first thing that we're introduced to really is his Tawbah. Right? Because it's showing us that there's always a way for redemption, that there's no permanence to mistakes that you make. Unless uh, you don't choose to do Tawbah, but if you choose Tawbah, then it can always be fixed. It can always be saved. It's not too late. Uh, and that that is a big blessing. Right? That the stain doesn't remain forever. That you can remove it. So he says, to do Tawbah, right, you have to look at three things. وقعودك على الإصرار على أن تداركه مع يقينك بالنظر الحق إليك. so the first one in خلاء على الإسماء حين إتيانه when you committed that sin before that you were not committing a sin right so it's not like a permanent state something that happened right and that means that usually if you're a believer, you're not committing a sin. But this thing came along. So, al-Isma then, here in this sense, means that you were not committing any mistakes. You were as, it was as if you were infallible at the time. However, when you commit that mistake, think about that, that now you're not like that anymore. And why would you not want to go back to that state of seemingly being infallible before you committed the mistake? to understand the, the, the nature of how damaging the sin might be. وَفَرْرُكَ and الظَّفْرِ بِي And also consider your happiness, your joy, when you committed it. Because no one commits a sin and they're happy and they're displeased with it while they're doing it. They do it because it's going to bring some type of joy to them. That's how that death I am. So, um, Consider this also to have remorse later on about the sin, because that too is a sin. To be to be joyful, and then to seek that, and then you commit the sin, and finding joy in it. And also standing still and not doing anything uh, to fix it. While at the same time knowing that Allah SWT sees what you're exactly what you're doing. But nevertheless, you negligent, you delay it, maybe you continue, maybe you say, well, at a later date I might think about this. So all of these things contribute to, um, to propel you towards Tawbah. Because within the sin itself, there's these three things that increases the damaging effect upon it. So it's as if it's not the sin itself. But the effects, and these are the three of the effects, right? That you, it's as if you're, you're not seeing Allah anymore, right? It's as if you're not caring about what's happening with that. There's three conditions to Tawbah. To be remorseful, which some of them said is not really uh, a condition you can go about and fulfill easily, right? And then Tawbah for the Hadith. It means like you can't have tawbah, it's not going to count, it's not real, unless you you regret it. What type of tawbah is it if you don't regret it? Right? Like some of these apologies that politicians make today, you know, 
والله لو لو الحاجه دي قلتها جرحت شعورك انا اسف ايه يعني لو اف اف ذس انت فعلا جرحت شعوري So there's no اعتراف there's no acknowledgement and the basic thing about Toba you acknowledge it was wrong not if you were offended it was wrong it was غلط وخلاص so you remove this kind of fake preamble to it saying you know if this and this and this and if you didn't like it so you in that sense you make it more about the person than about yourself right it's like you know as if, but I think the whole time is like, that's what you say almost, rather than saying I made a mistake, and your reaction is completely justified. Even if you didn't have the reaction, that's not the point. I did something wrong. So a net, a regret means that you realize that that takes place in your heart. When acted on, right? Act it out here he translates as apology, but it's bigger than apology. It also means rectification, islah. Right? It's not just enough to say sorry unless uh, if there's other things involved. If you you know if you said something about someone, if you back bit them, riba or nanima, and they weren't there, it's not enough to say sorry to the person, you have to fix it. By doing what? Going to the group that you're talking to. If you said, I think of Fulan that we we saw the fifty shirt or charities, whatever. Oh, Fulan that who I think of is we saw that we had big sympathy, and you said that in front of people. If it's true, if it's true, this man Hima. If it's true, if it's not true, it's Mahad Amin, which is worse. So even if it's true about them, you shouldn't go spreading it like that. So the thing is, then you go back to those people and say, you know what, I made a mistake, I misspoke. Uh, I, figure, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, just ignore what I said. Because it's very, very damaging. right? When you change it with the people's perception of somebody based upon maybe your perception may not be right or a lie, it's like you killed them. Right? It's like... خلاص أنت شطبت هذا الشخص من قائمة هؤلاء هؤلاء الناس يعني. They're not he's not he's blacklisted by the kid. It's very very damaging, especially nowadays in the age of media, social media, internet, because if you wrote it somewhere, right? Even if you delete your Facebook to a comment or your your tweet, someone could have captured it and it's still there. It doesn't go away. It could be there a very long time, and. It's happened to people when, you know, a certain thing, they made a mistake. If they go search the name of that person, خلاص, on the first page of Google, always that thing's going to come up. Five, ten years later. That's the thing that everybody knows, that they become famous for. Even though maybe they moved on, and maybe they, you know, they made, they apologize, but since we kind of recorded it, and uh, it sticks around, so especially now, I think, when you know, we have this high level of documentation of the things that we do online, you have to be very, very careful about the things you put out there. And then he says, Hakatli Toba, three things, the reality of it. Ta'dim al Jinayu Tehem Toba, Motalab Aadab al Khalifa. which means more like Ta'dim and Mujna Ali. So Ta'dim al means the sin is bad, but also consider who you committed it against. That's where the Ta'dim comes from. That's why it's so bad. And that's why the Na'mah is so great. See how it's all in relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But people generally, they dismiss things because they think, so what? Who, who got affected? That's what we usually say. But, Madam Allah SWT, Madam Ashi Kaza, Khalas, that should be enough for us to stop. That's what we mean by Ta'atheem. And Ta'atheem is the state of the heart. Right? It's it's not logic. Some people, they like, I think that's a Mughalim logic, yeah, you got him to So, who says your logic is right? 
You guys remember TOK logic? Mm -hmm. So, uh, sometimes your logic is wrong. Sometimes we, the sense of the logic is dark is sah, the deeper is sah. And sometimes things don't enter into logic. The ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are two types. Al mu'allala, right? In other words, those that have logic behind them, there's a, a reason, it makes sense. Yani, tahrim al khamra, for it makes sense because. في تطيب للعقل ممكن واحد يتصرف تصرف مش لو ما كانش سكران مش يتصرف كده وكان yeah that makes sense but some things they're not معلنة they're تعبدية what they say by تعبد is there because Allah says so however even the تعبدي doesn't mean that it doesn't have a حكمة a wisdom right but the difference between حكمة and علم the hikmah is something that not everybody may arrive at and understand. It's easy or it's discernible for the people who uh, need to know it in order to relate it to other ahkam. So if we say, for example, that means any muskir, so why? Because the illa is clear. However, a hikmah doesn't work that way. So if we say, Allah SWT said in the Salat al-Makhah, the Aisha al-Baha, Shman. Do we say, Malush A'i Sabah? No, we don't say Malush A'i Sabah. Fi'i, Hikmah. But we don't know what that Hikmah is. We may never know what that Hikmah is. But everything about Ahkam Allah, everything, Kula Hikmah. There's nothing like, you know, just, uh, in vain, yeah. there's nothing like it, just there's no reason for it. There's a reason for everything. Why bin Sabah after Salawat? Why not Khamsu Khamsin or Amiya? That Allah the Muftah. Right? And sometimes these hikam relate not to things that we can perceive, but things that we cannot perceive. Right? 33 is the best. Afterwards, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, wa akbar, li, because it's a key, right? Like you have the key that has the, the teeth on it. You can have a very nice gold key that has but it doesn't open the door you need to open. At that point, it's it's simple, zero, it's the worthless. But you have the key that's made of plastic, right? But it has the right teeth and it unlocks the door that you really need to get into. At that point, still more than that. So the Sharia works like that, especially for the Ibadat. Right? There are, it's Malia bin Hikam. So just because you don't see a logic behind it, don't dismiss it. Why do we do Hajj in the way that we do it? Nibbis and Mashakir, with Allah Ta'ala al Kaaba, with Ram al Jamarat, with Sa'id al Safu al Marwa, with Wukuf bi Arafah, what is all that? Kudla Hikam. That things that may not even really you come to realize until the next life. But that means what it needs from us is to at least understand that I may not understand everything. Right? Understand you may not understand everything. And that's not said Hikmah. Right? Adam and Idrak, Idrak. Knowing that you don't know and can't understand everything. That's really the eye, the opening to know it. What is it, Tehami Toba? What is it, Tehami Toba? He says here, doubting the repentance, not doubting it, but um, being suspicious of your sincerity. Khlas, in it. We believe that Allah is the Tawbah, because He says so in the Quran. But how sincere am I in it? And then the last one, أعذار الخليقة And I mentioned this earlier, uh, if you made a mistake against somebody or some people, then you have to try to fix it. Then he says, صراع الحقيقة الدوبة ثلاثة أشياء So, first he says, حقيقة الدوبة, this is صراع, which means more subtle things. Right, we, we're getting deeper into the meaning of Tawbah. 
التمييز والتعطية من العزة ونسيان الجناية والتوبة من التوبة أبدا. So the first one تمييز التقية من العزة Distinguishing subterfuge from integrity Like the verse in the Quran With a qilah taqida akhadatu al-izzatu bil-ithm fa'asbuhu jahannam Right, and if it's said to someone taqida akhadatu al-izzatu bil-ithm Say it to the taqida to me Right, that's the people, the other people have like in Tashaq al-Diniya لا تتقي لا يعني تقي لا that's a موعدة that's for anybody أخذت العزة right so to to distinguish between تقوى تقية and العزة so تقوى actually is that which prevents you from sin والعزة is it نفس in this way it brings you to sin right and it brings you to the sin even you don't realize that you're doing it it's like a veil أخذته العزة بالإث بالإث right ونسيان الجناية here he says forgetting the sin in the first one he says تعظيم الجناية now he says نسيانها what gives? why the difference? here he's talking about صراعه the other one was what it is now what about the secret of it so there comes a point when it is better for you to forget it than to keep thinking about it when you move on you've moved on halas don't keep thinking about it because that's not you anymore you could think of the, the you that did that as a different person and you've moved on from that so it's actually counterproductive to keep thinking about it. So at this point, it's better to forget it. مِنَ أَبَدًا فِي الله So making your making tawbah with the tawbah. Tub in What does that mean? means that التوبه تبقى الأقصى وهتبقى مليئة بالعلال it's going to be not that it's shortcoming it has deficiencies so realize this about yourself and say أنا توب إلى توبة بتاعتي because the verse says وطوبه إلى الله جميعا so جميعا includes حتى التائب right even when he's making توبة هو داخل في التطاب so Tawbah from Tawbah means that you should never be at a point like Anna Khlas told him, Allah Dhamma Tahi Wa Ta'u Stop asking about it Not to other people but inside yourself Tawbah in a Tawbah Right, don't even, you know Have a sense of that I'm repenting that I didn't do the repentance even in the most Best way that I could possibly do it Now he takes us even to the deepest level at this point The Ta'if Salat Al Tawbah Three things too. أولها أن تنظر بين الجناية والقلية فتتعرف مراد الله فيها إذ خلاك وإتيانها فإن الله عز وجل إنما يخيل العبد والذنب لأحد معنيين أحدهما أن تعرف عزته في قضائه وبره في ستره وحلمه في إنهاه راكبه وكرمه في قبول العذر منه وفضله في مغفرته So first, he says that that sin that you did, look at it and compare between what he calls here al-qadiyya, yani al-qadab al-qadar, and what you committed. So from aqidah, we know that nothing goes outside of Allah's qadab al-qadar. Nothing goes out outside of his ilm, or his uh, irada, or his qudra. So it's not like you, you defy Allah's command. But you did not defy Allah's will. That's impossible. No one can do that. Yeah, in other words, Allah I did something and he couldn't stop me from doing it. If you actually believe that, that's a crime you believe that. 
So what I go in against was his command, not his will. So then the question that you ask is, well then why did it happen? Why did he let me do it? So he says he lets you do it in Ahad Mani, for one of two means. The first one is, how do we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They said there's two ways of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, you know him by way of his actions, what he does, and that leads you to know his attributes. And his attributes are of two types, Jamali and Jalali. So the Jalali, or the, let's say the Jamali attributes first, من صفات الجمال الرحمة اللطف الرأفة uh, you know these attributes that are of beauty but then we have جلالي attributes which are attributes of awe and magnificence أو المنتقم القهاء والجلالي والإكرام المقتدر these are attributes of قهر of compulsion of power and Allah is both so sometimes he lets you commit the sin when there's actually a reason, a wisdom behind it. So that you can know what he says here, his izza and his qada. Right? Even though he commanded you to do something and you didn't want to do it, you wind up doing it anyway. You learn to respect that there's a izza about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa birrahu fi satrihi. You committed the sin, but nobody knows about it. That's a, that's a meaning. If you never know, know that meaning, then you're missing something about Allah. If you never, if you go through your whole life and you never know, Satrullahi Jameel. So even in his Jalal, there is Jamal. So you committed the sin, Hada Shaykh Jalal. But he covered it for you. Hada Shaykh Jamal. And if, if, you didn't, if you didn't go, if you never found out that meaning, you're missing something. You're missing a big thing to know that meaning. وَحِلْمِهِ فِي إِمْهَلِ رَاكِبِهِ وَالْحِلْمِ Right? Think about it. If, if you willfully commit a sin, isn't that deserving of some type of punishment? But فِي إِمْهَلِ يعني. Allah may not take you to task. You know, you continue on. Some people will say, well, if it was a sin, it was really bad, then Allah would strike me down and punish me. And right? That means you don't understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is actually about his uh, his birr and his hilm. He's being clement with you, he's being easy with you. So the way to look at it is despite all of my mistakes and all of my shortcomings, he still gives me pause, which is uh He still gives me a chance. Anyway. So this is what we call by yani al fahm alilah, really understanding how Allah and the relationship between you and him. وَكَرَمِهِ فِي قُبُولِ الْعُذْرِ مِنْهِ Right? He accepts your forgiveness. هو كريم. How many of the people who don't accept forgiveness from other people? Allah always accepts it. He'll always take it from you, no matter what. وَفَضِّي فِي مَغْفِرَتِي And his grace in accepting your forgiveness to the degree that it's no longer there. It's like it didn't happen. It's like it didn't happen. No one forgives like that except the Lord. No human being can forgive like that. No matter if they forgive you, but like the idea that it didn't even happen, unless you did some type of uh, mind uh, or memory erasing procedure, they're always going to remember it. So it's not like it didn't happen. They may learn to live with it, but it's not like it didn't happen. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, literally it's like it didn't happen. Yom al Qiyamah, you're not going to see it there. You're not going to see it in the Hisab. The second reason Right? Right? Allah has the hujja. If he wants to deal with you by his aq, he has every right and reason to. Because you did commit that sin, you did commit that mistake. And for some people, you know, they're going to find that. And for others, they're not going to find that. But Allah is just. 
Right? Allah doesn't uh, He doesn't wrong anybody even one little bit. So if that's the case, he still has recourse because you did do that. We wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second Latifa or the secrets of Tawbah and Ta'ala in the Talab al Basir al Sadiq Sayyidatu Lam Yudhi Lahu Hasanatan Bihal. لأنه يسير بين مشاهدة المنة وتطلب عيب النفس والعمل So this is deep right? It says Either way you don't have حسنات لم يقل له حسنات what do you mean Mahish Hasanat? We were just talking about how we battle the Sariyat Hasanat with the Wuni and the So one or two things. This is the, and he says, this is the Basir al Sadiq. Right? When he commits a sin at Basir al Sadiq, he knows that I really don't have Hasanat that I can attribute to myself. Why? Lenno Yusir bain al Mushahadat al Minna. A Mushahadat al Minna. Yani, Hagadimish Bitati Aslan. Allah SWT wa Fatani. He's the one who gave me the opportunity to do it. So why am I using it as a bargaining chip with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I say, It's not yours to begin with. So this is Mushahadat al-Minna. Or, really, you're going to, Salawati that you think you did, this is what you're bargaining with, when you're thinking about the soccer match and you're thinking about uh, where you have to go eat lunch while you're praying and you think that this is So you see that you There's too many problems with it Or Allah is the one who gave you the success to do it So either way you don't use that as a way to see yourself as superior. Because one of the Sufiya, they say that you're not really a Sufi until you think everybody's better than you are. And people have a hard time with that. Because they say, no, that can't be right. Because look at those people, they say, hey, but that means you're still seeing your stuff. You're seeing your stuff. You're seeing your things. But if you really saw it, you can't sell it, number one. Or, if you can't sell it, it's not yours to sell, to begin with. It was given to you. So either way, you fish hasan. And Latifa Thaniya, Thalitha, sorry, the last one, and Moshad al Abd al لم تدع له استحسان حسنة والاستقباح سيئة لسعوده عن جميع المعاني إلى معنى الحب. Remember this is this level is like the one who has مشاهدة التوحيد who only sees Allah. He doesn't see sins. He doesn't see good deeds or bad deeds or even himself or herself. All they see is Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So that's why the language here seems contradictory or counterintuitive. So he says here that Mushad al Abd al Hukm, Hukm e Hukm Rabbina, how will that be called the Hadashi? It's all part of Allah's plan, right? And He made it happen. So that means istihsan hasana, it's not yours to do. Well, istikbah sayyida, it's not yours to do. But rather, you transcend that, you move beyond it, ila ma'na al Hukm. And that Allah hakama bi hadashi. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't see the ugliness. I know it's ugly, but not I don't see it, but it's like I move beyond to a level beyond just that level of just ugliness or goodness. And all I see is Allah. Right? Because if you say, you know, I did this and I did that and I'm doing this, there's all this I in it. But if you take the removal of the I, yani in nafs, me, 
to its logical conclusion, then no sentence of yours is going to start off with the word I. Right? So that means everything is going to be about he, Hoa, and no more Anna. That's what he's, uh, he's referring to. And I have to say, these are these are These are things that, you know, he, he puts an outline, and I'm not claiming that I understand it completely, but he's trying to just give us an idea. But ultimately, you won't really know what he's talking about, especially in this last third one, unless you go through it yourself, you experience it. So it's, it's very difficult to put experiential things into words. Like if someone asks you, what does uh, honey taste like? You would say, like what, sugar? Like what? No, not like sugar, but um, it's different. Specifically, you cannot. The, no matter how many number of words that you use, someone who's never tasted honey is not going to be able to understand what you're talking about until he actually, she actually tasted him or herself. So the same thing here. Oh, yeah, he can imagine to he get a man and am, but it doesn't do justice really to someone who's experienced it. And then the last section we'll be looking before we think finish for the night. فَتَوْتُ الْعَمَّ لِسْتِكْثَارِ الطَّاعَةِ فَإِنَّهُ يَرُوْ إِلَى ثَلَاثِ الْأَشْيَاءِ So the tawbah of the amma then really comes from the idea that they see their good deeds as so great. That's why they think the bad deeds are so little. So يَرُوْ إِلَى ثَلَاثِ الْأَشْيَاءِ brings three things. بِلَا جُهُودْ نَعْمَةِ السَّتْرِ وَالْإِمْحَالِ You don't recognize the blessing of Allah covering and giving you pause, as we mentioned, because you think you got all this good stuff going on that the little thing, is bad, you don't see it. Wuriyat al haq ala Allah, as I said before, and a mustahiq. Right? And I'm a hukuk ala Allah bin al Allah bin al Allah. And I'm a tulu kaza wa kaza. Mashallah, Allah bin al Haili, what I'm a ta, you are a hawa, you are a ta. Who says you have rights upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He has rights upon you. It doesn't work that, that way. It's the other way around completely. But someone who sees only his deeds and in essence sees only themselves, they will never think like that. So tawbah al amma is to have tawbah from these thoughts to begin with. That's the real tawbah. You think you don't need Allah. Right? I don't need his hilm. I don't need his satr. I don't need these things because I'm a good person. I'm a haqqa sah. I'm a shatr. I'm a shatarti. I'm a kaza. So all this ana in this, right? What did Qarun say? Innama utitu ala ilmi. I have all these things because I'm a shatarti. I gave it to him. That's basically what he said. Qarun. فَخَصَفْنَا بِهُ وَبِهِ الْأَرْضِ خلاص. He was a sign, he was an egg, because he took it to the logical conclusion, where he said that I have everything I have because of you. وَصَحْبِ الْجَنَّتِينَ سُوْتُ الْكَهْفِ Same example, similar example. Right? I have this, there's no way it can go away. If I think I get to Jannah, I'm not going to find something better than this. حَتَّى نَلَقْ نَقْ بِكَلَمَةُ الْكُفْرِ Based upon his own self-appraisal, has led him to that. وَتَوْبَةُ الْأَوْصَاطِ The middle group مِنْ إِسْتِقْلَالِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ Right? By seeing the sin, they may not see their good deeds as that great, but they think the sin is بِشْحَاقِ بِرَيْنَا وَوَعَيْنُ الْجُرْأَةِ وَالْمُبَارَزَةِ وَمَحَدُ التَّزَيُّمِ مِنْ حَمِيَةِ وَالْإِسْتِسَالُ الْقَطِيَةِ Describing that. وَتَوْبَةُ الْخَاصَةِ The select group مِنْ تَضِيعِ الْوَقْتِ وَيُطْفِئُ نَعْلَ الْمُرَاقَبَةِ وَيُكَدِّرُ عَيْنَ الصُّحْبَةِ So in Khasa, they understand that their tawbah, they know they're on a path of uh, not trying to commit sins. So usually when they do, it's something that شِعَارَدْ يَعْنِ Not something they did willfully. But they know they waste a lot of time. And they're not using their time wisely. And so they make tawbah from that bad use of time. تَضِيَعْ الْوَقْتِ 
فإنه يدعو إلى درك النقيسة ويدخل إلى المراقبة right because مراقبه means you're vigilant of your time you're watching what's going on and what's not going on like every step that, and everything that you say and you look at you know you want it to have a purpose you want it to be deliberate you don't want it just to be كده حاجة عفوية and there's no meaning behind it so they're looking for meaning in all the things that they do so their goal would be when they lose sight of that when they slip in that sense ولا يتم مقام التوبة إلا بالانتهاء إلى التوبة مما دون الحق ثم رؤية علة تلك التوبة ثم التوبة من رؤية تلك العلة. This is the hardest line in this section. Uh, so التوبة is not complete إلا بالانتهاء إلى التوبة مما دون الحق. In other words, Anything that gets in the way of your tawbah, al-haq, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which could be your tawbah itself. In other words, where he says here, ru'yat illa tilka tawbah. In other words, to see that, to say about yourself, ana ta'ib, ana So just like the person who said, ana kwais, ana mishmahtag, ana mustaghni, what did he start your sentence with? Ana. Same thing here, ana tawbah. That's a illa. When you see your tawbah and you attribute it to yourself, it's no different than any other thing that you do. So when you attribute it to yourself, say, ana tawbah, fi shwayt haz nafs. Right? There's a little bit of izid nafs in that. When you say ana tawbah, wa hayyid illa. So he says, tawbah an tilka al illa. Right? Make tawbah from. This illa that you see your own tawbah. ثُمَّ التَّوْبَةَ مِنْ رُؤْيَةْ تِلْكَ الْعِلَّةَ Which means, oh, on a fikra, I don't talk to the same Allah, is that I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. You see, you seeing al-illa. فَتُوْبْ مِنْ دِي كَمَانْ You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So, huh? Yeah. Yani? Huh? Tawbah section. So, if you want to be too, we will add a one of the ways. Right? He says, Tawbah min hadi. Because you're seeing your Tawbah. Then the next person says, Ala fikra, Ala Tawbah wana shayif. And if you have a lot, then a shaykh and a ta'ib, but I'm a fikr, that's very good, then a shaykh and a ta'ib. Yeah, it's to think that you did enough, you should always continue to talk. Exactly, so a tawbah cubed, but I will eat. I didn't know that. But the thing he doesn't say here is it could actually be infinite, right? You could always say, well, I saw that, I saw that, I didn't have that tawbah. Must have been, yeah. But he stops it at this point, yeah. Very good. So, uh, if you look at your sheet, I say for Tawbah, think about three people who are the victims of your mistakes. And I call them victims because that's what they are. Right? You, you, you hurt somebody, so think of them as victims. Resolve to rectify those mistakes by making amends or seeking their forgiveness. And then consider how to avoid recurring mistakes by changing the situation that facilitates them. You know, avoid the circumstance. And then contemplate the attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that you are given insight to when you commit a mistake. What he talked about in the last section, right? That fi taban hada qada wa hada hukum. But maybe Allah is also trying to show me something. He's trying to give me insight into something. So rather than just lamenting that I made this mistake and not recovering from it, maybe there's something I can learn here about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala I did not know before. Maybe I learned something about Satullahi Gamil, right? How many other people who make a mistake with falah, and their mistake is less than yours, مثلا. and there's no falihah. هذا هذا شيء جميل يعني هذا شيء you تشكر ربنا عليه. So. Uh, I hope inshallah we'll get through all ten. I think we will, just because we had an intro and we're a little late today. But uh, the idea then is to finish all ten. 
Bismillah ta'ala, I thank all of you for coming. It's kind of late and you came from far away places from Qahira. Just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you said with the Qutafim and Yajazikum ala liyakum. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.